recording. Okay, excellent, everybody. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, <clears throat> there's not Hashem tonight. We are learning Parashat um, Shavua, Parashat Kitetzeh. This is the parasha that contains, uh, I believe, the most mitzvot in the entire Torah, which is an incredible thing. There's a tremendous amount of things to talk about in this week's parasha. Um, however, of course, we're uh, only limited, we're limited to a certain amount of time, but I wanted to zone in on a couple of key points that I think <clears throat> are important for all of us to, to, to know about and to learn. So, so let us begin. I wanted to zone in on this week's parasha on within the first uh, earlier part of the parasha, there's a very interesting discussion. So the second aliyah starts off with Lo tired chamor achicha osh sharon noflim ba derech vehit alamta mehem hakem takim imo. So the Torah tells us you're not allowed to see that your brother's donkey or his ox is falling on the side of the road because he's got a very heavy burden and you just walk away. You just kind of, you know, turn in a different direction because you don't want to go and help him out. You have a special mitzvah to go and to uh, do the mitzvah called te'ina, to load it back onto the donkey or to the ox and to help him to get back on his way. That's number one. Now, <clears throat> the Torah then goes on to say, Lo li gever alisha velo ilbash gever simlat isha. That male garb, meaning male clothing, shall not be on a woman, and a man shall not wear a woman's garment. For anyone who does so is an abomination of Hashem. Ki to'avat Hashem kol oselet. Anyone who does such a thing, it's an abomination of Hashem, your God. So I would like to, Bezad Hashem, focus in on a couple of points here. I want to first of all ask a very basic question, which is, what is so bad about a woman wearing uh, men's clothing and a man wearing women's clothing? That's number one. The first question that's on my mind over here is why is that something which the Torah uses a very strong language? It says, Ki Hashem kol it's, the, it's an abomination uh, of Hashem, your God, anybody who does such a thing. Why is that something which is so such an abomination? That's number one. Also, what's bothering me is the connection. Uh, what is the connection between the fact that the Torah just talked about something which seemingly is incredibly random? The Torah says that if you see your fellow's donkey or ox off to the side of the road falling down, the, the person who sees that cannot just turn a blind eye and walk away, but rather he has a special mitzvah to go over and help that person. So the question is, you know, what is the, you know, what's the connection between that and the next part, which is that a man cannot wear women's clothing and women cannot wear men's clothing. That's number two. And also, Number three, what about the idea of, of, is it just clothing? Is it just a question of clothing that's a problem? But if, if let's say it's behavior, then it's okay, or is behavior as well an issue to think about, that that's also a problem? So I want to get into all these issues. I want to understand why, and I want to understand what's behind all of this, and Be'ezrat Hashem hopefully will come out with some clarity. So let us begin. Let us begin. So Rashi tells us on the beginning. Rashi is the first address for this issue of understanding wh where is the great abomination? If a woman, let's say, I don't know, puts on a black hat, a man's garment, what is the, the incredible abomination about that? Why is that so terrible? So let us see Be'ezrat Hashem what's going on right now in Rashi. And we'll start to get a clearer picture. So Rashi tells us, a garment of a male shall not be on a woman. Says Rashi, that she should be similar to a man, in order that she should walk amongst men. This kind of 
behavior is only for the purpose of committing ni'uf, which means adultery. So Rashi opens up our eyes over here to the first step, which is that this over here is a problem, it's an abomination, because by her being similar, similarly dressed to a man, she walks amongst men and that will lead to adultery. Now, the question that I have on this is, well, how exactly is a girl who's wearing a suit and tie uh, or a girl who's, I don't know, wearing a black hat uh, going to now walk amongst men and commit adultery? What is that? What is, what is going on over here? That's what Rashi said, but it requires further clarification because I, I don't really understand how that has anything to do with adultery. So in order to understand, we need to look further in the Rishonim. And if you look in the Ibn Ezra, if you look in the Chizkuni, and if you look also very much so in the Abarbanel, you will find a very interesting discussion about this, which Rashi is talking about, how this could lead to Niuf, which means adultery. So the idea is like this. They explain that this behavior, a woman who would get dressed up in men's clothing, was trying to basically trick the men around her. She would get dressed up. She was, let's say, a, God forbid, a married woman. And she was trying to uh, find somebody that would be, uh, that uh, she perhaps would be attracted to her and she could commit adultery, God forbid. Now, Baruch Hashem, Kalal Yisrael, we're upstanding individuals. Most of us are, are people who would never even uh, dare to even think about such a thing for half a second. Thank God. And if we would see something like that, if we would see something in front of our own eyes that looked even remotely close to that, that would immediately set off alarms in our head. We would, we would try to prevent such things. We would do whatever we can to make sure that doesn't happen. So this lady would employ a trick. She would make use of a trick, which is that she would get dressed like men from top to bottom. And what she would do is she would go ahead and she would have the outer appearance of a male in order to basically wiggle her way through a particular community where there are men or wherever it may be. And, and men would see that, you know, this other guy is walking into the house of so-and-so and there's no problem with that. People visit each other all the time. Friends visit each other, you know, all the time. There's no problem with that. So therefore they wouldn't think anything of it. Meanwhile, the whole thing was just a disguise in order for her to be able to uh, get into this other guy's apartment or home without being recognized by the community. So over here, the Mefarshim say very clearly what the problem was, that there are suspicions that are raised whenever a woman walks into the home of another man, uh, especially if they know that, let's say, his wife is not around. And those suspicions are avoided by her not looking like a woman. She got dressed up like a man. And therefore, she comes in and out silently. Nobody knows, nobody hears, and everything is good for her. So she thinks. Obviously, HaKadosh Baruch watches everything. But this was how she would do that. So that's the explanation that you find by the Ibn Ezra, by the Chizkuni, and the Abarbanel speaks it out very clearly. And he furthermore says a couple of more things which I would like to share with you as well to understand better what was going on over here. Because now the next step is going to be Okay, well, that might work for a woman trying to dress up like a man so that she can stealthily, you know, make her way throughout, you know, the community and without being you know, caught. But, but a man dressing up like a woman is going to be a lot harder. I mean, if, that's the, if that was the issue, then it's harder to understand what's going on. So let's take a look at the words of the Abarbanel inside. So he says the following. He says, Velo haita. First of all, he says, you should understand. He says the issue was not the idea that she's wearing, uh, a, you know, a black hat. The issue was not that she's wearing a suit and tie and she still looks like a woman. That wasn't the problem. But rather the problem was the result of this. This was a trick that she used in order to increase immorality, in order to increase promiscu promiscuity. In order to have uh, adultery, forbidden relations, that would result from this, 
שכבר הזהירה עליהם, that the Torah already spoke about many times. So this, so in other words, the Barbanel is learning the act itself of a woman getting dressed in a suit and tie is not per se the problem. Although it's forbidden, meaning the Torah says it's forbidden and therefore it is forbidden. But what was the directive of the Torah saying that this is Asur? The answer is in order to prevent immorality, immoral acts, in order to prevent adultery from taking place. So that is the way the Abarbanel explains it. Now, the question that we would have to ask ourselves is why then is it a problem for men? So the Abarbanel addresses that too. And he says the following. He says that when it comes to men, then also what they would do, um, lo alenu, was when men were trying to engage lo alenu in uh, acts of, uh, of same gender relations. So what they would do was um, the male would wear women's clothing in order to increase, in order to, to uh, arouse the other man, in order to get his passion on fire, so to say, so that he would have the appearance of a female as well. That's what the Abarbanel explains with disrespect as well. That was what the Torah was trying to completely eliminate and remove from Kalal Yisrael totally. All of this you find in the Abarbanel, which is really an amazing explanation. And now I want to share with you the next point, which I think the Abarbanel is going to address, which will open up for us a really, I think, deep understanding on a deeper level of what's going on over here, besides for all that we already just mentioned. The Abarbanel then goes on to ask the question that we had before, which is, what is the connection between the rule that when you see someone's ox or someone's donkey off to the side of the road and you can't handle the, uh, you can't handle the load, you have a mitzvah to go and help your fellow to go and load up the donkey again, so that it shouldn't, uh, you know, so that he shouldn't be there doing it by himself. Special mitzvah, okay, very good. What is the connection between that and lo ilbash gever? Lo ilbash, lo, uh, the pasuk says lo yihye kli gever alisha. What is the connection between that and, and no male clothing on a woman? They're right next to each other. There must be some reason. Says the Abarbanel, the idea is like this. He says, we know that it's the way of a man to be involved in these mitzvot. If you see some guy stuck on the road, on the side of the road, and he needs help changing a tire, we know that if it's a family who's pulling over to help the guy, it's usually gonna be the dad, for the most, most of the time, that's gonna get out and try and help the other guy who's stuck on the side of the highway. That's the, the mitzvah of prikau teina, which means when a donkey cannot go ahead and continue, or the guy needs help loading up the donkey again, or the opposite, there's too much weight and, and the, the donkey is suffering and you have to help the donkey to unload the burden. These are mitzvot that generally would be done by a male, would be done by a man. And the Torah over here is telling us that it could very likely be that a person were to see this kind of scenario and he would say, uh, you know, I don't want to get involved in it. I, I'm not interested in such a thing. He all of a sudden feels almost, so to say, kind of like, uh, you know, avoiding his obligation, avoiding his male duties. And over here, the Torah comes and tells you that, no, 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 you're, you're not allowed to do that. When a man is obligated to do certain things, you cannot all of a sudden come and try and, you know, you know, uh, shrug off your obligations. You cannot push it on your wife. You cannot, you know, avoid it and just become almost like as if it, you don't have an obligation, as if you're not a man that's supposed to be involved in these types of things. You cannot do that. You're supposed to go ahead and gather your strength and get involved and, and shoulder the burden together with this guy who's off to the side of the road that needs your help. You can't avoid that. And that's what the Torah is telling us. Yes, that this is your role. You are a male. You are someone who has that extra strength for this reason, for the, for the moment that it's needed when that guy's off to the side of the road and he needs your help. This is why Kadosh Baruch Hu gave you that strength that you should be able to go ahead and to do that. Don't all of a sudden try and pretend that you don't have that extra strength that you're like, so to say, like a lady 
that doesn't have the abilities to go and help her. It's not common or it's not customary for her to go ahead and to help her, to, to that other guy. No, you have to make every effort to go ahead and to do that and to honor your obligation as a male in the Jewish nation. Over here, the Abarbanel, I think what he did was he opened up for us a very beautiful opening to understanding, I think, on a deeper level what's going on, which is the idea that men and women have different roles. And a man's role is one thing and a woman's role is a different thing. And a man doesn't have the right to avoid his role. He's got a job to do and he has to do his job. And that's what the Torah is telling us over here. Lo yihyeg kli gever al isha. The job of the man should not be pushed on to the woman or vice versa. The man cannot say, I'm like a lady, I don't, I don't have to do it. No, you have a certain job to do and the lady also has a certain job to do. And what we're going to show now is that there's a great reason why the kelim of the male clothing of the male, the tools of the male, which according to one opinion in the Gemara and Masechet Nazir, Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov, uh, Eliezer ben Yaakov, Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov held that over here we're specifically talking not only about, uh, we're talking specifically about, about weapons of war. He says that's why, very interestingly, when uh, the Mfarshim point out, when Sisra was retreating from the war against the Jews and they were losing terribly, he was the head of the, uh, of the enemy army and Yael Hakeni went out and greeted him and told him, come into my tent, come into my, uh, into my home. And she, so to say, was going to take care of him. And the Gemara tells us that she did very, you know, very uh, trickily, uh, very, uh, you know, uh, very cunningly uh, gave him to drink. She gave him milk and she, you know, put him to sleep. According to the, the Gemara, she had relations with him seven different times. And uh, he was sleeping and he was out cold. And then she took the yated, a peg, and then she uh, shoved it through his skull and she killed him. So the Farshim say, how come she didn't take a knife? Why didn't, why, what, what's the idea of the peg? So they say it's because of this pasuk, because of the, the idea that lo yekli gever alisha. And she knows that the, that the knife was not a tool for her. That's a tool of war for men. And women don't do war like that. She took the peg. Very interesting thought that the Mufarshim bring down over here. But the point is that there is a concept that the Kli Gever, the idea of the man, the, the male's tools, the male's clothing should not be on the woman. And the idea that I'm trying to get at is on a more Kabbalistic level to try and explain why is it so that that's really a problem. And I'd like to start in order to explain it with a very beautiful Gemara in Masechet Yuma, and this is on Daf, I believe, Mem Zayin Amud Bet. This is the story about Kimchit. Kimchit was a woman that merited to have seven sons that were all Kohanim Gdolim. All seven, it's amazing, seven boys, each one reached the highest level that you could possibly reach in Judaism, which is to be a Kohen Gadol. Not one, not two. I mean, even just one is amazing. A mom of a Kohen Gadol is like unbelievable, but not one, not two, not um, seven children. Kohanim Gadolim is amazing. Now, by the way, how did that happen? It happened not because one died and the other one took over, but rather there were moments where the Kohen Gadol, who was at the moment Kohen Gadol, was impure for whatever reason. Some guy who was impure had 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 a conversation with him and he spit on him and he became impure. That's they had to bring a di different guy to be Kohen Gadol for the meanwhile, the second son became Kohen Gadol and therefore the third son and the fourth son. So in these kinds of instances, they all became Kohanim Gadolim. But bottom line, she had seven sons, Kohanim Gadolim. How'd that happen? So the Gemara says that the rabbis asked her this question and what they, 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 they wanted to know, what was so special about yourself? And what she said was a very interesting thing. She said that me'olam lo ra'u korot beiti kile'e sari, that the walls of my, uh, of, of my home never saw the braids of my hair. Now, what does that mean? It means that, as you know, the Torah commands a woman who is married to cover her hair. 
that we learned from the Isha Sota. This woman, now any woman who has that mitzvah, is not obligated to have her hair covered in the privacy of her own home. That obligation is when she's outdoors in front of other people. There's no obligation when she's in the privacy of her own home. But this woman, Kimchit, she went ahead and she not only um, covered her hair outside, but she even covered her hair inside so much so that she testified about herself. The walls of her home never saw the braids of her hair. Now, the question that we have to ask ourselves is, why is that so special? Why is that unique? What is, what is special about that? Okay, it's new, it's wonderful. But if you're keeping the rules of, of modesty, so then that's, that's always going to bring you blessing. That's always wonderful. Why is that? Um, I mean, plenty of people did that. So what was so special about, okay, so she's doing extra in her own home. Why is that something that will help her to bring uh, seven sons that are going to be koanim gdolim? What's the idea behind it? So in order to answer this question, the Ben Yishchai over there, I believe it's in the Ben Yoyada, goes ahead and asks, of course, another question. And he tries to explain the following. He says, you know, when Hashem created Chava, so it says that he created her from the rib of Adam. And it says over there, Vayiven Hashem Elokim et tzela. Hashem built the tzela. He built her from the rib. Now, the Gemara learns out a very interesting thing. The Gemara Masechet Shabbat Dav learns that the idea of the word Vayiven, which means, which comes from the root Bone, means to build, but that word has another meaning as well. In the Isles of the Ocean, it says that they call braiding, when you braid something, Benaita. So the Gemara learns out over here, which is the same word as Vayiven, Benaita. So the Gemara says, this teaches us that before HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave over Chava to Adam, he braided her hair. He braided her hair and then he gave her over to Adam. The question is, why? Why does Hashem have to braid her hair first before he gives Chava over to Adam? What's the idea behind it? Why can't he give her over to Adam? And then down the road, she'll like to braid her hair. She'll braid her hair. It's a big deal. So over here comes along the Ben Ishchai, quoting the Ariya Kadosh. And he explains the following. He explains that men and women are two different creations. And men, he explains, are from the part of Rachamim, mercy. The, the, the creation of man primarily is rooted in Hashem's mercy. Women, he explains, are rooted in judgment, in severity, in harshness. That's the way that Hashem created men and women differently. And there needs to be a balance. There needs to be, there needs to be severity in the world and there needs to be mercy in the world. And they're both there in order to provide that balance, which is necessary. He goes on to explain that the hair that comes out of any person, man or woman, represents the judgment and harshness that Hashem has in the world. Customarily, men have shorter hair. The reason that they have shorter hair explains the Ariya Kadosh is because of the idea that they are rooted in mercy and rachamim. And it's not appropriate for them to have longer hair because of the fact that the hair represents judgment and harshness. So therefore, they cut it in order that it shouldn't be on them because it doesn't work, it doesn't match. But when it comes to ladies, on the other hand, their hair is appropriate, so to say, for them because of the fact that the hair represents judgment and harshness and we need that in the world as well. It needs to be a balanced world. It needs to be a world that has both, that has both mercy of Hashem and also judgment from Hashem, harshness from Hashem. So it's a good match that the hair should grow on a female who's rooted in judgment. That's, that's what the Ariya Kadosh explains. Now, over here, Hashem is saying it's true that a woman needs to be, so to say, the one who has the longer hair in a sense. She needs to be the one that has that, How, because of the fact that 
the judgment works with her. She and, and the judgment, it, it's able to, to, to match one another. However, I don't want the judgment to have free reign. I don't want the attribute of, of deen, of severity and harshness to be in control. It needs to be balanced. It needs to be that there's a, a, a balance in the world where the judgment and harshness and severity is not overpowering the rachamim. It's not overpowering the mercy of the world. So therefore, Hashem did not give Chava over to Adam as is, with the hair long and, so to say, unchecked. But rather, she went ahead and, she, and Hashem braided the hair of Chava. The act of braiding the hair of Chava, so to say, contained the judgment, contained the din, contained all of that, trapped it, so that, in a sense, the attribute of mercy has more power than the attribute of judgment. It, it should be balanced, but tilting more towards judgment, towards rachamim and mercy than judgment. We always do things like that in our practice, always. When we take the cup of netilat edayim, we take it with our right hand because the right hand represents mercy, and then we pass to the left, and then we pour from the left on the right to show that the left is subservient to the right, so that the left is judgment, that, that it's pouring on the right, serving the right, which is representing mercy. So over here too, that's the same idea. HaKadosh Baruch Hu had to braid first the hair of Chava to show that the judgment which is needed in the world is at the same time subservient and subdued to the mercy that's in the world. That's how Hashem wanted it. Because if not, the world wouldn't be able to properly function. So therefore, when he gave Chava over to Adam, he braided her hair first. Now, take a look at what this tzadeket, Kimchit, told her, uh, told the rabbis of her generation. She said to them that, Me'olam lo ra'u korot beiti kil'ei sari. Never have the walls of my house seen the braids of my hair. You ask yourself, why did she have to mention that she braids her hair? So that over here, she's telling them a message as well. She understands that when a woman covers her hair, what's going on at that moment is that she is now trapping the dinim. She's trapping the judgment, the severity, and the harshness, all of that judgment from heaven that would be on her body or on her family or on her community. All of that, instead of it going wild, she's trapping it. She's not allowing it to go free. She understood that's what's going on. And what instead takes the place of all that harshness and judgment and all of that stuff, what takes the place of it is the rachamim, the bracha, the mercy of Hashem, which allows for blessing to come to a person, which allows for uh, all of the wonderful shefa, abundance from heaven to come down because the dinim, the, the judgment is trapped now. It's covered up. That's something which is huge. That's why when a person starts to cover their hair, they, they, they bring down tremendous amounts of blessing on themselves because the, the, that which was blocking it from coming is actually now being subdued. And therefore, it's a huge, huge thing that's taking place. Now, this woman, not only was she covering her hair, but before she even covered her hair, she had put it in braids. So in other words, she was doing something by far greater she was trying to do with her hair something for the benefit of basically the entire world. She's saying, this is what was happening with Chava. So I want to do the same thing as well. I want to braid my hair first to subdue the negativity, to subdue the judgment and the harshness that's in the world, to allow for Bracha and Shefa to come into the world. So she's doing that even before, and then she's covering on top of that her hair. So she's doing all of this really L'Shem Shamaim for no reason other than to try and increase the mercy of Hashem in this world, which is, a, which is a really holy, holy endeavor. The rabbis responded to her. You should know a lot of other people have tried it too. They didn't, it didn't work for them. And what they were saying is that, yeah, you know, it's a wonderful thing, but the difference between you and them is that you actually did it with Hashem Shamayim 
and they're trying to have Kohanim Gdolim children. So it's a little bit of a difference between you and them. But the point remains the same nonetheless, which is that she was trying to do something really very, very special. Now, being that that's the case, so we understand that the source of, of a woman's creation and the source of a man's creation, according to the Kabbalah, is different. That the woman is rooted in judgment. The man is rooted in, in mercy, in rachamim. So now comes along the Pnei David, which is Marana Chida, and he sheds light on this as well. And it's very similar conceptually to what we just spoke about. And I want to read it to you inside to hear his words itself. It says Maran Achida in Pnei David on this Pasuk. He says, If Shal Yermoz, if Shal Yermoz, ki sofei tevot, he says, I want to show you something very interesting. If you look at the words, lo yihye kli gever, which means that there shall not be the garment of a man, right? That's the Pasuk we're talking about. Let's take the sofei tevot, which means the last letters of those words. Lo ends with aleph, which is one, okay? Yihye ends with he, which is five, so one plus five is six. Kli is a yud, which, which is a ten, so that's six plus ten is sixteen. And gever, man, ends with a resh, which is two hundred. So the two hundred plus sixteen is two sixteen. So says the chida gematria, that comes out the same numerical value of gevura. Gevura means um, severity, strength, right? The idea that, it, in other words, the opposite of mercy, but uh, strength. Also, gevura is 216. Why? What's the idea? That a woman should not have any kind of weapon, which is what we've been talking about according to Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov. Shehem asuyim gevura, which are for the purposes of strength and severity. Man, says the Chida, comes from mercy. So, if he girdles his loins and goes out to war and he has the sword, so the judgment is not so bad. Because again, to begin with, he's a, he's a being which is rooted in mercy. So to, for him to take upon himself the sword and to go out into war, so that is something that it will not increase the judgment on the world so much so because of the fact that he's, to begin with, rooted in mercy. There will be some kind of a sweetening of the judgment, being that he's a man. But a woman whose her creation is in judgment and severity, if she increases that, then tihye dinakasha. That will be tremendously difficult uh, judgment and harshness on the world, uh, on the world, ad kula, uh, the whole world. Belachen lo ye kli gever alisha ki en na ella gvura lachzik bekli zayin ki belavachi midat gvura because that's the whole reason why she, she to begin with is the attribute of judgment. So to increase that is actually very harmful, very problematic for the world, and therefore he says that's why the end of this pasuk has to do with gvura. So the idea is, and then sends, says the Chida, let's finish off the piece. He says, Why shouldn't a man wear the clothing of a woman? Because the clothing of the woman is, is the covering of din, of judgment. He says the man is now going to enclose himself with something that's judgment and harshness, which is not what we want. We don't want him to be like that because that's not fitting for him. That's the idea. So over here explains the chida that in that embedded in this in this um, mitzvah over here is actually a very deep understanding of what is the correct thing for women to be doing and what is not the correct thing for women to be doing. So it's a it's a very uh, very powerful thing to understand what it is that's actually going on over here. It's a deep understanding of, of the root of men and women in general. I saw a very important point brought down from the Malbim. The Malbim says over here something very interesting. He says, a woman who wears tzitzit, he, I, I, this is the first time I've ever seen this. He says, a woman who wears tzitzit 
is in violation of lo yekli gever alisha. He says, as, as a matter of fact, I saw the chibay etera adds another point. He says, that's why by other places it says lo tilbash or lo yilbash, means do not get dressed in, do not dress up in such and such thing. Over here it says, there shall not be, there shall not be clothing of a man upon a woman. Why doesn't say a woman shouldn't get dressed up in men's clothing? What, what's there, there shall not be? He says, because that's a reference to the way the Torah says, the mitzvah of tzitzit. So lo yiyeh, in other words, this commandment is actually a commandment, especially for the woman to not wear the tzitzit of a man. In other words, there's a role that men have, and there's a role that women have. And confusing the role brings damage. That's the point. It brings damage. That this woman who's wearing the tzitzit of a man, for example, is doing something that's not positive in the sense of Kabbalistically. The Torah is telling you, yes, it might be considered something that uh, perhaps is a mitzvah elsewhere, but for you, it's the wrong thing to do. That's the way the, the Malbim and the Chibai Terah uh, learn this idea over here. And it's, that's why he says the Pasuk uses the language Vehaya to tell you that that Vehaya lachem letzitzit lo yekli gever alisha to tell you to, to Hint to the same language. I hope the point is clear. So that's very important for us to understand that there's a very big difference between, between men and women in this sense. Now, I want you all to know that this halacha, as from a halachic standpoint, I just want to mention a couple of things briefly, uh, and then we'll move on to the next point. From a halachic standpoint, there are lots of ramifications. We started off with a question is it only a matter of garments or, the, or is it behaviors as well? And the answer is halachically, the Torah views behavior of, of a woman for a man as a big problem too. For example, the Gemara says many times that melaket levanot mitoch shorot, if a person has white hair, gray hair, and he goes ahead and tweezes them out or plucks them out in order that his hair should still look young and that he shouldn't be old, that says the halacha is considered to be a woman's type of um, behavior. And loyil bash gever simat isha applies over there as well. So the question comes up, can one dye his hair? So from the simple standpoint of the halacha, the answer would be no, you can't dye your hair because it's a big problem because you're behaving like a female. Um, there are times, however, where Rav Moshe Feinstein did permit a person to uh, dye his hair. The reason being that if let's say the person really was a young man, and he was trying to get a job, but his hair is all white, and he looks much older than his age. So then he felt that that's not tricking the person who's hiring him. He really does look young, but he really should look young because he is young, and uh, he's not trying to behave womanlike. It's a very interesting discuss discussion that Rav Moshe has. Um, he's because he, he held he's just trying to get a job, and therefore there are times where it's permissible. Another question the Poskim talk about uh, the Gemara already talks about. Can one uh, look in a mirror, a male? Can a male look in a mirror? Or is that considered to be womanly behavior? From the strict standpoint of the law, the halacha would be that it's forbidden for a man to look in the mirror. Came along Rabbi Vadia Yosef Zatzal in Yechavedat and actually permitted it even for Sephardic men today. So the bottom line is it is okay. But just to get a concept of what we're talking about, the behaviors of, of women should not be on men. And the behaviors of men should not be women. It's a very important thing to understand. And of course, the big question that we had now, can a woman have a weapon? That's what we talked about with Yael. So it's a whole big to do. But the point I'm trying to bring out is that everybody has different roles. And it's important that people should play their role properly. And that's, uh, these halachot do come, they do, they do uh, take place. Now, So therefore, and I just want to end off with this one last point. We asked before, so one second. So one black hat, a suit and tie, that really changes everything. It changes, changes her look, changes, uh, does it accomplish that much? And the answer is once the Torah said that it's forbidden, so it became forbidden in every shape and form. The behavior and even just the one garment that she's wearing, which is a male garment already becomes a sur, even though it's not for the purpose of promiscuity, even though it's not uh, for any other kind of ulterior motives, just the, the act alone, the Torah uh, decided is considered to be an abomination. Okay, that's a very important point I thought we should talk about. Next, 
the Torah tells us further in the parasha, the mitzvah of ma'akeh. Ma'akeh means that a person has an obligation, if he has a home, to go ahead and to uh, put a railing around the roof. If someone has access to the roof, God forbid he should fall off and, uh, and, and hurt himself. Don't let any blood come into your home, God forbid. Make sure that you put a railing up so that people shouldn't get hurt. Very important, very simple and very practical, very understandable. The question is, how did a person get the mitzvah of ma'akeh? The answer is right after over here, uh, the mitzvah of not wearing men's clothing, women's clothing, the Torah gives us the mitzvah of shiluach haken which means sending away the mother bird and not taking away the eggs while the mother bird is present. So over here, it tells you that you have such a mitzvah and immediately following that mitzvah, it says, Ki bayit when you build a new home, so then you shall uh, build a railing for your roof. And again, you have to ask the question. It's amazing. We're, we're, we're just in four paragraphs over here. We're, we're in so much depth, it's unbelievable. So again, the question, paragraphs number three and four, the mitzvah to send away the mother bird, the mitzvah to put up a railing around your rooftop. What's the connection? Why are they next to each other? So comes along Rashi and tells us very clearly, the reason that they're next to each other is because if a person does the mitzvah of shiluah haken, he, he goes ahead and he sends away the mother bird like Hashem told him to, and only then he takes the eggs at that moment, that person has merited to do another mitzvah. He will now merit to have a home of his own in order that he should merit to do the mitzvah of ma'akeh. In order that he should merit to do the mitzvah of putting up a railing. So because he did the mitzvah of sending away the mother bird, that's why he merited to do the mitzvah of ma'akeh, of putting away the uh, of, of putting up a railing. Now says Rashi a very interesting point. He says, Ma'ake, Rashi says the following, Gader Saviv Lagad, it's a, it's a fence that goes around the roof. If you look in the translation of Unklus, Unklus says that the, that the ma'ake is called in Aramaic a teyaka. Teyaka, says Rashi, is the same word as tik. Tik means a, like, you know, like a suitcase, a briefcase, a bag, you know, a backpack, something that, that holds things. Says Rashi, shemeshamer ma shebetocho. That this thing um, holds whatever is inside of it. So the simple understanding of Rashi is, that you have people on the roof, and Baruch Hashem, you put up a ma'akeh, you put up a railing, and the ma'akeh holds whatever is behind the railing from falling, from, from getting hurt. That's the simple understanding of why Unklus translates it as a teyaka. However, if you look in the Be'er Yosef, which is one of the great commentaries uh, on Rashi and all, and all the Chumash, the Be'er Yosef explains, based on what we're saying now, that no, it's not about protecting the people on the roof. The mitzvah of ma'akeh is protecting the entire house. Based on what we said a, a minute ago, the mitzvah of shiluah haken gave you sachar mitzvah mitzvah. Whatever the reward for the mitzvah is the ability to do another mitzvah. So you were afforded the opportunity to do the mitzvah of ma'akeh. How can you do the ma'akeh if you don't have a house? So HaKadosh Baruch Hu has to send you a house, has to give you a home to live in, in order for you to be able to do the ma'akeh. So in other words, a person could think to himself, oh, look, I have a new home, I have a new house, everything is good, right? And now oh, Hashem wants me to put up a ma'akeh. Okay, should I do it? Should I not do it? He starts thinking that way. Says the Ber Yosef, what we're learning now is that this is all incorrect. The whole reason to begin with that Hashem gave him that house is because since Hashem saw that he did the mitzvah of Shiloh HaKed, that means he's faithful to the Torah. So Hashem is expecting him to be faithful to this mitzvah as well, which is, which is only possible if he has a house. But he's going to give him the chance to do this mitzvah. But ultimately, the whole reason that he got this opportunity was for the sake of doing the mitzvah of Ma'akeh. 
Amazing. But he's thinking that he earned it, he did it, he got it. Little does he know the whole reason that he's getting a house is in order to perform the mitzvah, ma'ke, to do the mitzvah. It's a very big lesson for us because often enough we say to ourselves, you know, Baruch Hashem, we have a nice home, we have everything that we need over there, thank God. We have food, we have all, all that's necessary for us. And at the same time, somebody knocks on the door and asks to come in. He needs a sip of water. He needs a place to sit down. He needs a place to stay. Again, this is not an easy, not necessarily an easy thing to do. But think about it. At that moment, you get a phone call from somebody and he says, I need to sleep over tonight. And you are not interested. You have no desire to let this guy into your house. No desire whatsoever. But maybe the whole reason that you have this house to begin with is because Hashem knows you're faithful to the Torah. And Hashem knows that you are somebody who cares about what the Torah says, and therefore you have a mitzvah of achnasat orchim, and therefore that's the whole reason why you have the house. You think you have the house because of the fact that you worked and you earned and you did and you accomplished, etc. Maybe the whole reason to begin with that you have this house is because Hashem wants you to do mitzvot with that house. Hashem wants you to have shirei Torah in that house. Hashem wants you to do achnasat orchim, gilut chasadim in that house. Hashem wants you to make your house a bed vad lachachamim, like the Mishnah says, to make it a place where the rabbis gather and meet and discuss things together. And, and, and that's why you have your house. It's amazing. We don't think like that. But it's very possible that that's really all that's going on over here. And therefore, if we don't want a Kadosh Baruch Hu to take it away from us, we have to make sure that we do the right thing with it. Because the whole reason we got it to begin with was in order to do the right thing with it, which is to do those mitzvot. So this guy thinks he's got a house because he accomplished so much and did whatever. Little does he know that it's, it's the reward for the previous mitzvah that he did of sending away the mother bird, where Hashem is now affording him the opportunity to do another mitzvah of ma'ked. That's it. That's the whole reason why he got whatever he got. Just because he's going to put up a ma'ked. That's the reason he got his house to begin with. Amazing point from the Be'er Yosef. So it's important for us to think like that sometimes because we fail to think like that. We think that we earned, we deserve. It's like the, uh, it's like the guy that uh, I heard this mashal from a Melech Biederman. It's like the guy who's sitting down by a wedding and uh, they serve, the, you know, the waiters come with, let's say, 10, um, 10 dinner plates for the people at the table or they have these big black circular trays with all the different main dishes on it. Uh, for the different guests that are there. They, they put it down next to this one guy who's sitting there and he says, oh, beautiful. They've got 10 different uh, plates over here. And uh, that's wonderful. He takes one, he starts to eat. And then all of a sudden he sees that uh, the waiters are starting to dish out all the different plates. And he says, wait, what's going on? It's all for me, right? No, that's not correct. It's not all for you. Everything that a person receives, he has to understand that it's not all for him. There's what to do with it. There's good mitzvot that Hashem is expecting him to do. And by the way, it's brought down that if a person is praying for something, if a person is praying for anything, let's say he's praying to find a zivug. Let's say he's praying to move to a better home. Let's say he's praying for more parnasah. It's always worthwhile to give a kadosh baruch Hu a reason, of, of course, bli neder, that you're not you're making a neder, but you're saying at the same time, Hashem, I, you know, please give me this home that I should be able to move to that home. And that way I should uh, do mitzvot with that home. I'll build the ma'keh, lean out there, and I'll, 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 I'll do achnasat orchim. I'll, I'll host um, shiurim. I'll do things, positive things with it. Then that's a reason. Again, what we're learning right now, the mitzvot that you're going to do is a reason for you to receive what you're going to receive. So a person that gives Hashem a reason, he says, listen, Bli neder Hashem, I want to do wonderful things with what you're going to give me. You're going to give me a shefa parnasa. No question that would, when I get that new, when I make this new deal, no question that there's going to be maaser to the yeshiva or chomesh to the shul or wherever you want to do, you're going to do it. But the point is, again, Bli neder, always Bli neder, but to, but to have that in mind and to execute it, Bizat Hashem. That's a very important thing because that way Hashem says, okay, he's going to do mitzvot with what I'm going to give him. So it's worth it. It's a good investment. Okay. Very good. And one last point that I want to share with you all. The, the mitzvah of Shiloh HaKen, which is the fourth paragraph over here. Amazing. We've only covered four paragraphs. But there's so much, and there's even much more to say about what we've already said anyway. But just to, to finish it off over here with the mitzvah of Shiloh HaKen, sending away the mother bird, the Torah tells us, actually the third paragraph, 
Torah tells us that there's a mitzvah not to take the, the eggs while the mother is hovering over it. Rather, shalech the shalach et ha'em, you shall send away the mother bird, ve habanim tikach lach. And then you shall take the, ve tabanim tikach lach, you take the, the eggs for yourself. So the Sefer HaChinuch and many others say that performing this mitzvah of Shiluach HaKen is a segula for boys, for, for children, for to having children. And if a person hasn't had children, so then a person who does the mitzvah of Shiluach HaKen, then he will have children, Be'ezad Hashem, because it says, when you send away the mother bird, then ve'et banim tikach lach, you take the children for yourself. So doing this mitzvah actually helps a person to have children. So... I have, uh, I had a, a Rebbe, my Rebbe, Allah Mishlom, Rav Belsky, Zecher Tzadik Livracha. I'll just share with you this story and then we'll call it a night. Um, the, the, the Rabbi, Allah Mishlom, had a daughter who lived in Yerushalayim and uh, together with her husband. And for many, many years, unfortunately, they did not have any children. And it was a big, you know, big trouble for them. Obviously, a couple that's married for a while, they want to have children. And they heard this. They heard this about the parasha that a person who has, um, who does the mitzvah of shiluach haken, um, they get the zchut of having children. And they decided when they came to visit for the holidays in New York that they were going to try and do it. They found out that there was an organization that helps people find such um, birds' nests, and they instruct them on how to do the mitzvah exactly, what to do. And then they go ahead and they they do it, and hopefully they'll have uh, the zchut to have children. So the son-in-law of Rav Belsky uh, was a very big medakdek, the mitzvot. He is he's somebody who really wants to make sure that he does the mitzvot properly. He doesn't take any, uh, you know, any, anything for granted. He really wants to make sure that everything is done perfectly. So he went ahead and he did the mitzvot. He went ahead and he went to this organization. They went and they, uh, they went ahead and they took him to a bird's nest and he sent away the mother bird, took the eggs, and he comes home. He says to his family, you know, I don't know. I think I messed up. I got to do it again. Something wasn't right. I did this part wrong. I did that part wrong. Fine. They call up the organization one more time. They go out again. And they are uh, about to do the mitzvah. He goes ahead. He does the best that he can. He does the mitzvah. He comes back home. And again, he says, you know, something just wasn't right about how I performed this mitzvah. Something was off. I got to do it one more time. So they call up the organization, they find him a place again to do Shiloh HaKen, and he goes and he does it, and he comes home, and yet again, he says, you know what, I don't know what's wrong with me, I just, I can't, I can't figure out what I'm doing wrong, I'm messing it up every single time. So his wife at that moment said to him, listen, you're not going anymore, I'm doing it. And she went ahead, she called the organization, she did the mitzvah, she came home, she said, I did it perfectly, everything was great, that was that. And suffice it to say that nine months later, they had quadruplets. Amazing. Maseh Shaya, true story. They had quadruplets. It's an unbelievable thing. Mitzvot of Hashem, Torah Hashem, it's all emit, it's all true. And it's so important for us to strengthen ourselves, especially in this time period, before Rosh Hashanah, before Yom Kippur, during the month of Elul, that Rosh Baruch Hu should help us to strengthen ourselves, to strengthen our emunah, to strengthen our understanding of what we have to do for ourselves, how we can improve ourselves. Like Allah should help us all, give us all Sheva Bracha Vatzlacha. And uh, with that, we're going to end. Thank you very much for joining us tonight, everybody. And Lee Neder, we'll see you all next week. Chazakim Abuchim. Vatzlacha.